It's likely the most powerful military bloc to have ever existed. An alliance with over 3.3 million active service members, a combined 5,943 nuclear warheads, and a GDP 10 times that of Russia. Currently made up of 31 countries stretching from Finland and Turkey in the east to America and Canada in the west, NATO is the Goliath of modern geopolitics. A concentration of old world and new world might. Yet this doesn't mean that it's invincible. Just as biblical Goliath could be felled by a single stone to the head, there are certain weak spots where the right attack could potentially take down the alliance, expose regions that keep NATO planners up at night, worrying about a future war. From the lowlands of Lithuania to the icy waters of the Arctic, we've delved into the literature on NATO's greatest points of vulnerability, the places that, if large-scale conflict breaks out, you should be ready to worry about. With a total landmass of over 27 million square kilometers, NATO's nuclear umbrella covers one of the largest alliances on Earth. An alliance that not just includes the US, UK, and Canada, but also Greenland, Iceland, Norway, Turkey, multiple Balkan nations, and the vast majority of the EU. In fact, the only EU countries not protected by NATO at the time of writing are Sweden, which is trying to join, plus Ireland, Austria, Cyprus, and Malta. With so many members, it should therefore be expected that the alliance would be overstretched in places that regions would exist where deterrence isn't perhaps as strong as it could be. Regions like the Suwalki Gap. A 65-kilometer strip of gently undulating hills and farmland dotted by villages, the Suwalki Gap is at first glance nothing but so much as a bucolic slice of paradise. This is the border region between Poland and Lithuania, a place almost devoid of people. Standing here on a warm summer day, you have no inkling that it's been called the most dangerous place on Earth. The reason it holds that title? Well, you only need to look to the neighbors to figure that out. The Gap's eastern frontier sits a short distance from the city of Grodno in Belarus, a country that's effectively a Russian client state. One crawling with soldiers and remnants of the Wagner Group that demobilized there after last summer's aborted rebellion. The western extremes, meanwhile, end at the border of Kaliningrad, a heavily militarized Russian exclave that's home to some of Moscow's nuclear weapons. In a 2022 article on the Suwalgi Gap, Politico summed up the fears of military planners like this. Just as Putin is trying to create a land bridge between Russia and the Crimean Peninsula, taking the Suwalki Gap could link Russian troops in Kaliningrad, a key Russian outpost, with those stationed in its de facto protectorate, Belarus. It's a fear heightened by the region's landscape, one that's devoid of natural barriers. As foreign policy has pointed out, quote, much of it is ideal terrain for tracked vehicles like tanks, given the very limited roadways and the gentle hills. Now, clearly, all of this would be worrying, even if the Suwalki Gap was just strategically important for Russia, but it's also seen as a potential choke point for NATO. Lying north of the Gap are the three Baltic states, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. Almost unique among NATO members, the Baltics are nearly cut off from the rest of the alliance. Squished up against Russia, Belarus, and Kaliningrad, they are only connected to Poland very tenuously by the two highways and one railroad that run through the Gap. They're also all former members of the Soviet Union and all home to large ethnic Russian communities. With a combined population of just 6 million, they're also incapable of fielding much military might. Lithuania, for example, was reported in 20 2022 to have just five aircraft and 20,000 men under arms. Because of this, the Baltics have long been seen as Russia's most obvious target within NATO. Even with the presence of battle groups led by the UK, Canada, and Germany, most war scenarios see the Baltic capitals falling to Moscow's forces within days. By taking the Swalky Gap, Putin could ensure that liberating them becomes much harder. The doomsday scenario is one where Moscow simultaneously attacks the region from both Kaliningrad and Belarus, severing the Baltics from Poland in a quick pincer movement. In 2021's Zapad training exercises, Russian and Belarusian forces practiced doing just this. Since this is NATO territory, it would immediately provoke a response. But while the Polish army and the US-led battle group stationed in the country might rush to the Lithuanian border, the region's lack of infrastructure could hobble a fight back. Per foreign policy, most of the major roadways through the Baltics are one lane each way, sometimes bordered by dense forests, coastline, or swampy lowlands. In the event of a Russian attack in the Suwalki region, it could be difficult to move military forces in while trying to let refugees out. Thankfully, the future outlook for the Swalki Gap may not be as grim as it currently is. Right now, the Baltic states and Poland are all too aware of what a weak point this border region represents, which are why plans are already in place to turn it from a soft underbelly into a set of armor-plated abs.
The greatest fear those living on the NATO periphery have is of being attacked and then watching as the Alliance does nothing. Oh, sure, the Alliance's collective defense clause, known as Article 5, means every other member is legally obliged to come to their aid, but in practical terms, would Washington really be prepared to start a shooting war with Russia over a 65-kilometer strip of sparsely populated farmland in rural Lithuania? Obviously, we can't say for sure. What we can say, though, is that this worry has helped shape a strand of thinking in the region, one best summed up by the leader of Poland's then-ruling party, Laroslav Kaczynski, in 2022, when he declared, The Americans will not defend us if we cannot defend ourselves. The idea is to show voters in the US that these countries aren't freeloaders and are thus worthy of protection. This is why Estonia spends over 3% of its GDP on defense, one of the highest levels in NATO, why Latvia and Lithuania both spend well above the 2% threshold. It's also likely one of the reasons why the Baltics, Poland, and broader EU are working in concert to improve the Sawalki Gap's infrastructure. The Transbaltic Railway, also known as Rail Baltica, is partially an economic project designed to further integrate the economies of Vilnius, Riga, and Tallinn to the rest of the EU via high-speed rail. But it's also a military endeavor, one that, on its completion in 2030, will remove some of the current bottlenecks that would keep NATO forces from quickly redeploying to the Baltics in an emergency. As Euronews has noted, once the project is completed, quote, the chances of successfully keeping the Baltic states cut off by closing the Swalki Gap are reduced. In a similar vein, although without the economic components, are the plans for resupply via Finland in case of invasion. Prior to April 2023, the Baltics were even more isolated than they are now thanks to Finland's status as a militarily non-aligned nation. But with Helsinki now a member of NATO, plans have been laid for the Finns, with NATO backing, to reinforce the region via the 80-kilometer strip of water separating their country from Estonia. According to NATO Defense College researcher Guillaume Lasconharius, quoted here via Euronews, the accession of Sweden and Finland creates a de facto NATO mare nostrum, translating to our NATO sea, with Russia probably being unable to exert a true anti-access or aerial denial strategy. Seen from this perspective, the Sawalki Gap suddenly looks a lot less dangerous than it did before. A weak point, yeah, but not fatally so. This will become truer the more local countries invest in infrastructure for the region. The harder it is to use as a choke point, the more Moscow will have to weigh up its basic utility. The European Consortium for Political Research's Loop blog points out that this utility is already quite low. With no good roads or rail lines crossing the gap from east to west, a Russian incursion might not only fail to cut off the Baltics, but also fail in its objective of making Kaliningrad easier to resupply. Still, it's not like the Sawalki Gap is the only hard-to-defend place that worries NATO planners. Less than 500 kilometers away in the Baltic Sea sits an island that could be key in any NATO-Russia showdown. Given that this is a video about NATO's weak points, you might be surprised to learn that the island in this chapter isn't actually in the Alliance. As part of Sweden, Gotland is, at the time of writing, outside the protection of the Collective Defense Clause. While Stockholm is expected to join the alliance sometime in 2024, that's yet to happen. Yet even if Turkey and Hungary never drop their objections to Sweden joining NATO, Gotland will still be important. Such as 200 kilometers from Kaliningrad, it could be quickly reached by Russian forces in the event of a war. And that's a major problem, because whoever controls Gotland effectively controls shipping lanes in the Baltic Sea. In the Atlantic Council's words, For the Alliance, the control of Gotland can make a decisive difference in the defense of Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Finland, and Poland. Covering nearly 3,000 square kilometers, Gotland has been called an unsinkable aircraft carrier. Air defense systems set up here could cover the entire Baltic airspace. This all makes it an extremely tempting target for Moscow. To stand a chance of winning a conflict in the Baltic theater, Russia's main hope is to create a so-called bubble of anti-access or aerial denial capacity. Principally, this would center around Kaliningrad, but seizing Gotland and deploying air defense systems there would make the job roughly 10,000 times easier. Because of this, Gotland has been seen as the center of Russian war planning for decades. Back in the glory days of the Soviet Union, Swedish spies uncovered plans to invade Gotland in case of conflict with NATO, despite Sweden officially being a neutral state. In 2014, US-led war games after the annexation of Crimea suggested Gotland would be a key to defending the Baltics. On the eve of the Ukraine war, Russian state television even broadcast a documentary boasting how Moscow would snatch the island in case of a broader conflict. Perhaps it's no surprise that the Atlantic Council has warned how, quote, a main attack against the Baltic states could be preceded by operations against Sweden. If all of this is true, then Gotland may represent a greater strategic choke point than the Sawalki Gap, the first weak link in the NATO chain, yet also one Putin could sever without triggering the alliance's collective defense clause. Obviously, Sweden's military planners are not stupid. They've long known the value of holding Gotland. 
Hence, the massive troop presence Stockholm kept there during the Cold War, 25,000 active troops with another 25,000 in reserve. There were also 36 tanks, 25 fixed artillery pieces, and a submarine base protected by mines. But notice the key part of that description, during the Cold War. Since the collapse of the Soviet Union, Gotland has gone from being a bristling porcupine to a military chihuahua. Peacetime cuts instituted in 2005 and accelerated after the financial crisis almost stripped Gotland of its once formidable defenses. At the absolute lowest point, the island's air defenses were deactivated, and the submarine base was almost sold to a Russian oligarch. By the eve of the Ukraine war, the troop presence stood at just 300. 300 soldiers who would have been expected to face the full might of an invasion from Kaliningrad. Now, I'm glad to report that things have improved since then. Today, in early 2024, the air defenses are reactivated and Gotland is protected by, quote, a mechanized battalion with CV-90 armored vehicles and Leopard 2 tanks, a home guard amphibious battalion, and an air defense missile system. The Swedish government has, meanwhile, invested $160 million in rebuilding the island's military infrastructure and defenses. Perhaps more importantly, in December of 2023, Stockholm and Washington signed a defense agreement that granted U.S. forces access to bases on the island and allowed them to pre-position equipment there, all of which will help to reduce reaction times. In short, Gotland today is better protected than it has been at any point since 2005. And yet, so long as Sweden officially remains outside NATO, it will remain the major weak point in the Baltic region, an island that could determine the outcome of an entire war. Not that Gotland is the only non-aligned island that could provide a headache for NATO forces. It's time we look at one of the most famously neutral islands of all, Ireland. Perched on the far western edge of Europe, Ireland has long taken its neutrality seriously. Not only is it one of the few EU nations that is not in NATO, but it also invests extremely little in its own defense, a mere 0.225% of its GDP. So small is the Irish military that Dublin long relied on a secret agreement with the British RAF to defend its airspace. At sea, things are equally homespun. The Irish Navy commands a mere six patrol vessels. Broadly speaking, this is how the Irish public likes things. While consultations in 2023 suggested some room for increasing the military's budget, the idea of Irish neutrality is hugely popular. Even the agreement with the RAF created controversy when it came to light for potentially violating the principle of non-alignment. From the NATO perspective, though, this is all rather problematic. With Ireland outside the alliance, its infrastructure is not protected by Article 5, nor would the Irish military be capable of protecting it in case of a wider war. A major issue when you realize that some of NATO's most critical infrastructure runs through Irish waters. We're talking about undersea data cables, the arteries of the global information network through which 99% of all internet traffic flows. While these crisscross oceans across the planet, some of the most important are the ones linking Europe to North America. According to RTE, these cables don't just allow Europeans and Americans to troll one another on social media, they also carry something in the region of 10 trillion euros worth of financial transactions every single day. Of these vital cables, about three quarters run through Ireland's exclusive economic zone. And there's not much evidence that Ireland is capable of defending them. In 2020, Dublin's own Defence Forces Review declared, The Irish Naval Service has no anti-submarine capability, and its ability to deter or even detect such maritime intelligence gathering is exceptionally limited. Not that it would take specialized submarines to cut through undersea cables. Speaking to RTE, analyst on McNamara noted that it only takes a couple of rusty ships with ship repair equipment to actually cut these cables. They're very, very weak and vulnerable and feeble in many ways. We saw this in late 2023 when an anchor dragged from a Chinese ship cut a data cable connecting Finland to Estonia, an act that's still being investigated as possible sabotage. In that case, severing the data cable didn't cause many long-term problems. But that wouldn't be true if a determined foe destroyed multiple cables connecting the US to Europe. Were an attack staged on cables off the coast of Ireland, the economic damage to the whole continent would be immense. Effective communications between citizens and governments could be hampered. Deployed at the right moment, such as at a period of heightened military tension, it could cause unrest or even panic among the public. Given that we have evidence that Russia and China have both been operating close to undersea cables, this is a real risk. In 2015, the New York Times reported our quote, Russian ships are aggressively operating near the vital undersea cables that carry almost all global internet communications, raising concerns among some American military and intelligence officials that the Russians might be planning to attack those lines in times of tension or conflict. This activity has already taken place in Irish waters. In both 2022 and 2023, Russian vessels were tracked, making strange movements around concentrations of data cables. The issue, of course, is what to do about it. 
Although in 2023, NATO established the Maritime Center for the Security of Critical Underwater Infrastructure, Ireland is not a member of the alliance. Nor has the Irish government, at time of writing, joined a spin-off program designed for NATO partners. And while an attack on infrastructure vital for NATO members might trigger a response even if it takes place in neutral waters, it also might not. The Center for Strategic and International Studies predicts that rather than the total destruction of these undersea cables, Russia is more likely to make them the focus of hybrid attacks, doing enough to cause problems for Europe and North America, but always in a deniable way. Or as CSIS put it, enough to, quote, cause significant damage to an adversary while operating below the threshold of detection, attribution, and response, and in doing so, blur the conceptual lines between conflict and peace. So far, though, we've mostly focused on weak points that Russia could take advantage of. Yet it's worth remembering that Moscow isn't NATO's only potential foe. High up in our planet's frozen north, another bad actor is working hard to get a foothold, to take advantage of weaknesses in an alliance that includes its greatest competitor. Of course, we're talking about China. Back in the halcyon days of 2019, one of the strangest news stories was when President Trump, apropos of nothing, offered to buy Greenland from Denmark. At the time, most people assumed it was just Trump trolling the media, and hey, maybe that's all it ever was. But it could also be read as a serious piece of geostrategic thinking, one born from the increasing interest Beijing is taking in the self-governing island. In recent years, China has started to invest in Greenland, not much so far, just some development aid and helping out with the construction of three airports. But according to the Jamestown Foundation think tank, focusing on the size of the Chinese investment is missing the point. To quote them, in a place such as Greenland, with so few people and so little infrastructure, even the number of workers Beijing has sent in and the size of the projects it has launched are comparatively enormous. On top of that, these projects help demonstrate Beijing's increasing interest in the Arctic. In 2018, China declares itself a near-Arctic state, a geographically incorrect but politically useful way of inserting itself into the growing rush for the frozen north. Much of that rush is centered on Greenland. The world's largest island, Greenland has a population of fewer than 60,000, sat atop vast natural resources. And while it's currently a member of NATO via Denmark, it won't necessarily stay that way. A push for full independence is underway, with 2023 even seeing the island unveil a draft constitution. This means that the future of the island is potentially up for grabs, and a tug of war is already emerging between the West and Russia and China over who will help forge that future. Foreign policy explains the stakes. Greenland has long been a zone of contention between Denmark and both Moscow and Beijing, which prize its potential natural resource wealth and strategic location astride the Greenland-Iceland-United Kingdom gap, the strategically critical body of water separating the North Atlantic Ocean from the North Sea and Norwegian Sea. This is a particular worry for NATO at a time when China is pursuing its Polar Silk Road initiative and looking to muscle in on Arctic waters. Were Beijing able to establish a close relationship with a post-independence Greenland, it would create an obvious weak spot on the alliance's northern flank. Already, the autonomous government in Nuuk is pursuing policies towards both Beijing and Moscow that are far friendlier than Denmark itself. Now, this isn't to say that an independent Greenland would necessarily fall into China's clutches. No, of course, it has a pretty good working relationship with the USA. Joe Biden recently signed a $3.95 billion deal to keep American forces stationed at Pitifix Space Base for another 12 years. A pretty big deal when you realize Greenland's annual GDP is only $3.24 billion. Still, it represents a future source of worry for the alliance, one made worse by Russia's attempts to cozy up to another autonomous Danish territory in the north, the Faroe Islands. There, the local government continues to allow Russian fishing vessels to dock, despite evidence these vessels are involved in espionage and attempts to sabotage undersea cables. Yet while NATO's north may be threatened in the future by shifting attitudes in places like Greenland and the Faroe Islands, it's also arguably threatened right now by one member's weaknesses. And it's a member with the longest Arctic coastline of all. According to foreign policy, Canada has spent the last few years severely underinvesting in its armed forces, spending a mere 1.3% of its GDP on defense. While not the lowest amount in the alliance, it's still lower than that of Germany, Italy, or Norway, and well below the spending levels of, say, the UK, Finland, Poland, or the USA. Now, in some ways, this doesn't matter. Even if Canada were outside of NATO, it's extremely doubtful that Uncle Sam would just sit idly by if Ottawa were attacked. But in terms of guarding against hybrid threats, it's a real problem. The country's icebreaker fleet is aging and in bad need of an upgrade in order to help deter against Russia and Chinese incursions in the Arctic region. 
As to be fair, there are signs that Canada is starting to shift course. The Ottawa Citizen reports that 2023 saw $30 billion in new defense deals inked to boost the nation's capacity. Whether the new kit will come in time to help out in the coming scramble for the Arctic is another matter. By now, it's hopefully clear that, like any military alliance, NATO has its weak points. Areas that need a little more attention or just some investment to secure them against potential bad actors. Now, of course, no video like this can ever be comprehensive, and it's possible we've missed something. Maybe there's a weak link somewhere that no one has yet noticed that will only become obvious when war actually breaks out. Now, hopefully, that doesn't happen. But it should go without saying that no military power, however mighty, can hope to become completely invincible. All we can do is highlight the places that might be future trouble spots, and then cross our fingers and pray that we never have to find out how wrong or right we were.